All right, uh, here we are, the minor profits for beginners, majoring in minors. This is lesson number 10, the final lesson in the series. Today we're going to do Zechariah and uh, Malachi. So our final lesson looks at two prophets who were very different in style and content. Uh, Zechariah uh, providing encouragement using visions and messianic prophecy, while Malachi deals with a specific problem using language and images that are readily understandable uh, and practical uh, to imp implement. So let's begin with the prophet uh, Zechariah. The name Zechariah was a rather common name among the Jews, means Jehovah remembers, or whom Jehovah remembers. There are over 25 persons um, by this name mentioned in the Old Testament. This one uh, person can be identified easily by means of several references to him in the text itself. So the internal evidence is what tells us uh, who this is, Zechariah was the son of Bechariah, uh, the son of Edo, chapter one, verse one. Uh, Ezra also refers to him simply as the son of Edo, Ezra 5, 1 and 6, 14. This is not a discrepancy or error in the Bible. The Hebrew language does not have a word that corresponds to the English word grandson. There's no grandson in Hebrew. And so the word son was therefore used to signify a son or a grandson or even a more, in a more general sense, a descendant of, a, of even you know, further generations. So a son meant someone you know, in, your, in your lineage. Uh, Zechariah himself was not only a prophet, but also of a priestly family. He was born and reared in Babylon during Judah's captivity there. And he returned from Babylon under the leadership of Zerubbabel in 536 BC. Read about that in Nehemiah chapter 12. Uh, he was still a very young man when he began prophesying in 520 BC and his youthful zeal was undoubtedly complementary to the old prophet Haggai uh, because they were contemporary. So Haggai was preaching at the, same, you know, at the same period that Zechariah was preaching. Two different messages, two different uh, styles. Uh, it's interesting to note that both Zechariah and Haggai were called into ministry in the same year and only a few months apart. Just show you a uh, scripture, a couple of scriptures here. So in Haggai it says, in the second year of Darius, the king, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest saying, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you read in Zechariah, it says, in the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the prophet. So they were called you know, relatively at the, uh, at the same time. Aside from his parentage, uh, he was the son of Bechariah, uh, Edo, uh, a priest in exile. And the fact that he preached to the people in Jerusalem while they rebuilt the city and the temple after their return from exile, there's no other information about Zechariah in the Bible. So what we know about him we know about him uh, because, of his, uh, because of his writings. Uh, a little bit about the time in which uh, Zechariah uh, ministered. Uh, the ministries of Haggai and Zechariah occurred in the same historical setting. The 70 year captivity in Babylon was over and the Jews had been back in their homeland for approximately 16 years. They had been tending to their own personal affairs during this period, but they had neglected their responsibilities to God. The temple was not yet rebuilt. Jerusalem and its walls were in ruins and the people were largely dispirited. 
And so it was under these circumstances in 520 BC that Haggai received his first message from the Lord for the people. And then two months later, Zechariah was called to the very same kind of work. And whereas Haggai's work lasted only a few months, we talked about that last time, Zechariah's ministry relative to the rebuilding of the temple covered at least two full years. Um, a writer called or named Charles Pledge uh, compares these two prophets in his book entitled Getting Acquainted with the Old Testament. And he writes, and I quote here, the work of Haggai and Zechariah complement each other, as does all work of faithful evangelists today. Haggai offered some stern rebuke and plain admonition, as well as encouragement. But Zechariah dealt primarily in encouraging words and visions, which would bolster the sagging faith of a weak people. As some of the older men recalled the former glory which they had enjoyed, especially the temple, and then observed their present weakness, it is easy to understand the disheartening attitude that developed. However, with the combined efforts of Haggai and Zechariah, the work of the Lord was accomplished. They were a great pair, the old and the young together working for God." Close quotation. So that's a quotation from a book called Getting Acquainted with the Old Testament, talking about uh, Haggai and Zechariah working at the same time, but in a different manner. So what's taking place here is that after the initial excitement and enthusiasm experienced by the Jews as they returned uh, to, the, uh, to their homeland and their return in, in a providential way to their homeland, and then the rush to begin rebuilding the temple, then reality set in with opposition from uh, neighboring peoples and the magnitude of the work. At first, yes, we're going to rebuild the temple. And then when they realized how much work it was going to be, and, and when they started getting threats you know, from neighbors, uh, threatening them not to continue the work, uh, you know, their enthusiasm cooled. Uh, and uh, the people uh, you know, went into shock and uh, they fell back uh, into the safety of doing the familiar things. And doing the familiar things meant simply taking care of their own houses and you know, growing their own food and uh, leaving the original dream, uh, the original task of rebuilding the temple, they just abandoned that altogether. So Zechariah is the longest book of the Minor Prophets with the uh, average length of the Minor Prophet books, about five chapters each. And when you get to Zechariah's book, there are 14 chapters, so it's rather a long book. His book uh, is the most complex as it contains apocalyptic symbolism as well as numerous visions, not easily interpreted. Add to these abundant references to a future Messiah more than any other uh, prophet. And you have a very challenging uh, book to summarize and to explain in the brief time that we have here this morning. One helpful thing we can do is to give you some information on apocalyptic symbolism. What is that all about? Uh, it's a literary device used by several prophets in the Old Testament. Daniel, for example, uses it. And of course, here is Zechariah, as well as figures in the New Testament. Jesus uses apocalyptic symbolism in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And of course, John in the book of uh, Revelation uses apocalyptic symbolism. So what is this apocalyptic uh, symbolism? Uh, well, it typically deals with themes related to the end times uh, or divine judgment and uh, or uh, the ultimate triumph of God's uh, kingdom. The word apocalypse comes from a Greek word, apocalypsis, which means to uncover or to take the cover off. A couple, apocalyptic symbolism refers to the uncovering or the revealing of certain truths concerning the end times or the judgment of God or the coming or the triumph of God's will or his kingdom 
using symbolic imagery, vision, and uh, language. Some of the characteristics of apocalyptic symbolism used by all prophets, including Zechariah, include the following. Let me give you a list. First, it includes vivid imagery. Uh, you have cosmic events, you have supernatural beings, you have heavenly visions to evoke awe and wonder uh, in the reader. Another characteristic, symbolic numbers and colors uh, are used to convey abstract concepts or spiritual realities. For example, the number seven refers to completeness or to uh, perfection. The color white uh, refers to purity and so on and so forth. Another feature, animal imagery. Animal imagery or depictions of strange or otherworldly creatures, you know, uh, dragons or hybrid creatures, a lion with a man's face, for example, to symbolize worldly powers or cosmic entities or spiritual powers. There's also cosmic catastrophe, uh, like uh, the moon turning into blood and the stars falling out of the sky. These are signs of divine judgment or the impending end of a certain age of an empire or a, a, a regional a king or something like that. There are also uh, visions of angels and demons uh, playing the role of messengers or warriors or ancients, uh, agents rather of divine, uh, divine judgment. And then there's also the question of dualism. Uh, dualism is the presenting of the cosmic struggle between God and Satan or light and darkness or forces of good versus forces of evil. Dualism, you notice that. You notice the battle or the great war taking place in the heavens. Uh, that's also a feature of uh, apocalyptic uh, symbolism. And then of course, there is the end time or eschatological themes, the end of the world or a judgment that will come that ends the, uh, uh, the world power of a particular uh, nation uh, or uh, resurrection or a divine throne or they talk about the new Jerusalem. All of these things here uh, are referring to end time. So when you take all of these elements here and mix them all together in a single book, in a single vision, it becomes quite a challenge to uh, interpret uh, these things. So apocalyptic symbolism serves to convey profound spiritual truths, to stimulate awe and confidence in the believer towards the ultimate victory uh, in the plans of God, no matter the present circumstances that one finds themselves in. It's interesting that uh, apocalyptic symbolism is used in Zechariah and what was happening at the time were that the people were discouraged and the, you know, the temple wasn't rebuilt and, and so Zechariah uses this language. Uh, Daniel uses this language. Uh, what was the situation then? Well, the people of God were in captivity uh, by a pagan nation. Uh, John uses uh, apocalyptic symbolism. Well, what was happening during John's time? Well, the Roman Empire was dominating and trying to you know, uh, eliminate the church. The church was under attack and persecution. So there's a, there's a relationship with the use of this type of uh, literature and what's taking place uh, with, the, uh, with the, people, the people of God. Um, a quick outline, if you wish, uh, of the book you know, if we were to outline the book, what, what are the parts? So there are four main parts to his book. First, a call to repentance in the very first chapters, uh, verses one to six. Then uh, Zechariah has eight visions, eight visions and their meanings. Chapter one, verse seven, all the way to chapter six, verse 15. Then in uh, the third part of the book, he deals with the question of fasting chapter seven, one, all the way to chapter eight, verse 23. And then there's a series of prophecies concerning the nations and the kingdom, 
chapter nine, verse one, to the end of the uh, book. Uh, he has a first message and then a second message uh, in these, uh, in these uh, prophecies. Now some main elements and details of this book include the fact that Zechariah's book is the longest and most difficult book of the 12 minor prophets. This of course is uh, um, uh, due to the fact that there's a great deal of, as we said before, apocalyptic symbolism throughout the book, which is not easily familiar to the modern Western mind. We don't think, you know, our literature doesn't contain this type of, um, uh, th this type of imagery, if you will. A key thought, however, is that the book was designed to encourage God's people. The triumph of God's purpose among men is answered. However, Zechariah insists that for this to happen, man must be in submission to God's will. One uh, other uh, feature uh, to note about Zechariah's preaching is his abundant references to the Messiah. Uh, commentary writer uh, Merrill Unger says that, and I quote, Zechariah has more to say about Christ than all of the other minor prophets. And that's in his uh, commentary about uh, Zechariah. Let's take a look at the content of uh, the book. We've kind of outlined it and I've mentioned to you some of the features of Zechariah's book. Very briefly, uh, here are the main ideas that make up the content of Zechariah's book. Section one, the repentance. He calls on the people to turn to God in sincere repentance. The prophet urges them to be better than their fathers had been. In their case, this would mean returning to the task that had been abandoned, uh, which was rebuilding the temple. That's what the repentance was for. Repent, change, change what you've been doing. You've been doing nothing to rebuild the temple. Change that, go back to the original task. Secondly, you have the visions. The second section, one, seven, all the way to chapter six, is a series of visions which are a comprehensive revelation concerning the future of the people of God and his kingdom among men. After this, he is given the task of crowning uh, Joshua. And so when I say Joshua, we're not talking about jo the Joshua and judges, you know, back in the time of Moses, this is Joshua, another person uh, named Joshua, who was a contemporary of uh, Zechariah. And we'll talk about him a little more later on. So Zechariah describes eight visions that he has, and we'll, I'll go over these very briefly. The first vision is horsemen among the myrtle trees, chapter one, seven to 17. The angel explains that they are sent by God to patrol the earth and report on its condition. This vision assures the Jews that God is aware of their situation and will bring about restoration and peace. The next vision is of four horns and four craftsmen, chapter 1, 18 to 21. Well, the horns represent nations that have scattered Israel. The craftsmen represent God's judgment on these four nations who have scattered Israel. The third vision, a vision of man with a measuring line, chapter two, verses one to 13. This represents Jerusalem being rebuilt, but rebuilt beyond its present site. This signifies growth and prosperity in the future, as well as God's protection. So you see the visions, they may seem uh, confusing, but uh, they were not meant to frighten the people, they were meant to encourage the people. And when you understand what they mean, you see you know, this vision of the, uh, of the measuring line. You know, God is telling the people, you rebuild the temple and it'll return to glory. Well, that would be an encouraging thing to me if I was living at that time. Next is the vision of Joshua, the high priest, chapter three, verse one to 10. Joshua in priestly garb before the angel signifies the renewal of acceptable worship to God by the Jews. 
this renewal and renewed priesthood will bring forgiveness of sin for the people. Remember, they had no temple. There was nowhere to offer sacrifice. How were sins to be forgiven? How could you give thanks to God in the proper manner? How could you offer God uh, something of value to demonstrate your piety to him? The temple had been destroyed. There, were, there was no priesthood uh, working. And so the idea of uh, a priest uh, being crowned by uh, Zerubbabel, uh, symbolizing the renewal of the priesthood, uh, meaning that the priesthood would once again be working, meant that access to forgiveness and the opportunity to praise God and to worship him in a proper way would be renewed. That would be good news uh, and encouragement uh, to the people and certainly a motivation for them to begin rebuilding the, uh, the temple. The next uh, vision is the vision of the golden lampstand and the two olive trees, chapter four, one to 14. The two olive trees represent Zerubbabel and Joshua, one a leader of the people and the other, Joshua, a high priest in the presence of the Spirit of God. This imagery signifies God's appointed leaders once again doing God's work in leading his people in the power and the direction of the Holy Spirit. How it once was, you know, there was Moses and Aaron, they were the leaders appointed by God. Well, now there's Zechariah and there's Joshua, appointed leaders uh, by God. And of course, it was meant to be uh, in order to accomplish God's work in any age. In order to accomplish God's work in any age, you have to have leaders. Uh, even today in the church, we have to have leaders in the church in order to accomplish God's work. The next uh, vision was that of a flying scroll chapter five, one to four. The scroll in this, um, uh, excuse me, the scroll is the curse that goes over the land of those who steal and swear falsely. It is divine and not human justice, the kind that rules in the kingdom of God. Next is the vision of a woman in a basket, chapter five, five to 11. A woman called wickedness carried off in a basket by storks to Babylon, a strange vision indeed. This symbolizes the cleansing of the land of the wicked influences carried back to the holy city and temple from Babylon, now being purified and sent back to its, uh, to its source, which is Babylon itself. Then the vision of the four chariots, chapter six, verses one to eight. Zechariah sees four chariots coming out from two mountains of bronze. These represent the four spirits of heaven going out to patrol the earth, the four spirits, the spirit of the north, the fear, spirit of the south, the spirit of the east, the spirit of the west, four spirits. You know, the number four usually refers to the, to the world, north, east, south, west, the four, uh, the four spirits. Uh, of course, these symbolize divine judgment upon the nations and the establishment of God's rule over the entire earth. And then there is the crowning of Joshua in chapter six, verses nine to 15. This action represents the dual nature of Joshua's role as king and priest, which symbolize a restoration of the ideal of the theocratic government that the Jews once had. Uh, the king was also a priest. The crowning is also a messianic foreshadowing in that when the Messiah would come, he would perfectly fulfill both the kingly role, he was the king of kings, right? But he would also fulfill the priestly role, uh, a priest in the order of Melchizedek, not a priest in the order of, of Aaron. Also, the naming of one of the crowns as branch uses another common figure for the Messiah to come, the branch. You know, he would be the branch. Uh, the Messiah was often referred to as the branch. In the end, God's command to crown Joshua in Zechariah 6, 9 to 15, symbolizes the restoration of spiritual and political leadership in Israel, anticipating the coming of the Messiah, and it offered hope for a future of peace and prosperity 
under God's rule. Note that even though the visions are bizarre and distressing, even difficult to understand, none of them represent a curse or a punishment on the Jews. Each one represents a blessing of some kind and taken together, they provide a great encouragement for them at a time of difficulty and challenge. All right, well, getting back to the summary of the content of Zechariah's book. So you had first a call to repentance, second, the eight visions and the command to crown Joshua, which we've uh, just looked at. Uh, next uh, is an admonition that nothing can be substituted for complete and sincere obedience to God. Chapter seven, verse one to chapter eight, verse 23. See, the problem was a familiar problem. Religious leaders emphasizing rules on fasting and other religious practices while neglecting to practice basic justice and mercy on those who were weak and uh, in need. And then uh, finally, God's promise for the future, chapter nine to chapter 14, in conflicts between Jerusalem uh, and heathen nations, uh, Jerusalem would be victorious. The future would bring doom to these other nations, but would also bring the Messiah to Jerusalem. The future uh, would bring a sifting that would separate fleshly Israel from spiritual uh, Israel. And even in the New Testament, Paul talks about that. You know, who is a Jew? Who's an Israelite? Who is the true son of Abraham, right? Well, Zechariah is talking about the same thing here. Fle there's fleshly Israel, you know, okay, you're a descendant of so-and-so and you're living in the city. And then there's spiritual Israel, you know, the individual who seeks to please God and to obey him and so on and so forth. A couple of lessons from Zechariah for our time today that we can uh, certainly uh, understand. First one is this, repentance is the first step in the process of renewal. Note that before Zechariah described his vision of blessings and success for the future, he insisted that God required repentance first. That's the first thing he says at the very beginning. You see, the Jews had to change their ways. For them, it wasn't, you know, they, it wasn't great sins that they were doing like idolatry or sexual immorality. It was returning to the original work of building the temple, which they had abandoned and thinking that personal acts of religious devotion, like fasting, for example, was a substitute for treating others with kindness and, uh, and mercy. To this very day, any spiritual progress from becoming a Christian to becoming a better or more mature Christian always begins with repentance. Repentance prepares us for spiritual life because in repentance, we let something go, right? Some fleshly habit, some improper attitude, some thought, some act, whatever. In repentance, something goes. And in repentance, we embrace something. Usually we embrace something spiritual, whether it be belief in Jesus or greater submission to Jesus, or perhaps some task or a mission from Jesus. In repentance, there's always something we let go and something that we embrace. So if you ever pray to God and you ask him to help you, to change you, to prepare you, to improve you, if you say, ever say to God in your prayer, God, please make me a holier man or make me a holier woman, you can, you can be sure that the very first step uh, in the answer to that prayer will be repentance of uh, some kind uh, that you will um, need to do. And then one other lesson from Zechariah, have faith because we win. Have faith because in the end we win. The people he was encouraging were a tiny little remnant of the Jewish nation who were rebuilding a city and temple in order to maintain the spiritual and cultural heritage so that through them, some 400 years into the future, the Messiah would come to offer himself for sin 
and establish the kingdom or the church here on earth, which would for 2000 more years preach the gospel, calling people into the kingdom and prepare for Jesus' return someday in the future. I mean, look how far back they were in the scheme of things. I mean, <laughs> they could not even imagine what God's plan was, you know, that, that God himself would take on human flesh and come as the, <laughs> they couldn't even imagine that. They, just the thought that may, one day God would, would win, you know, and they would be part of that victory. But beyond that, they, they, didn't, have, they didn't have the detail. Look how far back they were in the scheme of things and how much they didn't know. And yet they stuck with it because God sent them a prophet who used various visions to remind them that at the end they would win. It may not look like it sometimes. There are wars. There are rumors of wars. There's climate change. There's artificial intelligence taking over. There are people leaving the church, sometimes the church leaving the people. But Zechariah and John the Baptist and Jesus and Peter and John and Paul and today the Bible being spoken by all kinds of people, including uh, an Italian guy in Choctaw. And the message is still the same. Don't be afraid and don't be discouraged because Jesus is coming and when he does, we win, we win, that's, that's the message. All right, so that's the uh, message of uh, Zechariah, transferred a couple of thousand years forward into today. Let's, uh, let's go in and talk about the final uh, prophet, the final book uh, in the Old Testament and the final uh, book of the minor uh, prophets, Malachi. As I mentioned before, Zechariah's period was 520 BC. We now go forward almost a full century in order to review the last of the minor prophets and that would be Malachi. And so the name Malachi means my messenger. This man was the last writing prophet to serve as Jehovah's messenger to the people under the law of Moses. His prophecy was followed by 400 what we call silent years of history. For example, there was no further special revelation of God and his will until the time of John the Baptist and, and Jesus, of course. We don't have any details of the prophet's life uh, available to us. We don't know anything more about him that is revealed in the, uh, in the book that we have. Malachi was possessed of an intense love for the people of God. He therefore spoke to them with great urgency in the streets and market, marketplaces. You know, he was a preacher, he was a street preacher. So today we would say, he was a street preacher today. He spoke boldly and claimed the authority of God for his message. This prophet used the style of teaching and writing known as the didactic dialectic method. This method later became universal in the Jewish schools and in the synagogue. It is still quite effective in teaching and preaching. It's a kind of a question and answer method of preaching. For example, first he makes a, cha he makes a charge or an accusation, then the questions or objections of the accused are raised. These are then answered by a withering refutation there are seven distinct examples of this uh, method of affirmation, interrogation, refutation. Uh, there are several instances of this style that have been noticed uh, or noted rather in uh, this book. And I'll show you that in Malachi. I'll give you an example uh, in Malachi chapter one, verses six and seven. Keep an eye out for the, you know, the questions and the answers and the refutation. So it says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. Uh, there's a statement of fact. Then, if I am a father, where is my honor? 
And if I am a master, where is my respect? There's the question. Says uh, the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, the answer now, but you say, how have we despised your name? You are presenting, uh, then the refutation, you are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? In that you say the table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present, and here's the, you know, the wipeout, but when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Or would he receive you kindly? Says the Lord of hosts. Malachi 1, 7 and 8. So this style of question, answer, and then you know, uh, refutation at the end, there's several examples of this throughout Malachi. And as you read through Malachi, you'll, you know, you'll, recognize, you'll recognize this. Uh, a little bit of information about the time of the prophet. Uh, the date of uh, this prophecy is determined by material within the book, internal evidence. Scholars are in general agreement that its content agrees with the situation uh, described by Nehemiah in his book. This would place the writing of Malachi at some time between 445 and 425 BC, the time of Nehemiah's governorship. By way of summary, the people had been home from the exile in Babylon for approximately 100 years now. The temple had been rebuilt and so had the wall around Jerusalem, but the condition of the people themselves was not very good. They had returned to their former spiritual indifference and lethargy. The priests were lax and wicked, tithes and offerings were being perverted, the people were questioning the love and justice of God because of their poverty and their hard time. So they were slacking off spiritually and they weren't doing too well e economically. And in their prayers, they were saying to God, you know, we're doing everything you told us, you know, where's, where, where's the promise of the abundance? Uh, you know, where, where, when is that happening? So Malachi comes along and he speaks for God to the people uh, who have this particular mindset. This brings us, of course, to his message. Malachi comes along, uh, this wicked and despairing people, charging them with apathy and disloyalty to God. He reassured them that the Messiah was coming, but that he would have to punish them because of their sins, which he then specified. He thus issues a call for the people to learn obedience to God. So that's, the, that, that's the, you know, the outline of the book. That's what the book is about. If we were to do an analysis, in other words, if we were to break the content down, an outline if you wish, this is how it is broken down. Again, four parts to this book. First part, God's love for his people, declared and demonstrated. Second part, condemnation of the unfaithful priests. Notice. The, the condemnation is not necessarily the people, it's the priests, it's the leadership that is uh, falling down here. Uh, in verses, in chapter one, six to 14, their unworthiness, the priests' unworthiness, and in chapter two, one to nine, God's curse upon them. You know, in other words, Malachi tells them, here's why you know, your economy is failing. Here's why there's so much illness. Here's why you're not feeling, uh, you know, uh, you're not feeling good. So he, he tells them that God is the one that is punishing them. Um, then uh, the third part, people are rebuked for profaning marriage, uh, particularly alien marriage. The priests were taking wives from other nations to be to be their women from other nations to be their wives, which was strictly forbidden, especially uh, for the priests. It was forbidden to the people, but it was especially forbidden uh, to the priests. And of course, the sin of divorce. And then the final part, the coming of the Lord and the purging of Israel. And so he talks about God's justice, the Messiah's coming uh, in judgment, 
he talks about the sins, the neglect of the, the tithes and the offerings and God's justice needed to be defended. Uh, at the end, a final call to obedience and he references Elijah and Elijah's uh, work. So this is the, you know, a quick outline of the book. The content of the book, some material in there. The first section of the book is an affirmation of the love of God for his people. God really loves you, he tells them to begin with. Even though things are not going great, God really loves you. The second section moves immediately to show how that love has been spurned. It's not that God doesn't love you, it's that you have rejected uh, God's love. The priests have been faithless and had become stumbling blocks to the entire nation uh, by their lack of uh, spirituality and obedience. And then in section three, there's a stout rebuke of the people this time in general for their widespread sins against marriage. God would no longer accept their sacrifices because of their participation in and toleration of alien marriages and unfaithfulness and singleness, uh, sinfulness rather, resulting in divorce. Their faithlessness in marriage was a reflection of their failure in their relationship with God. Uh, the relationship with God had failed and because of that, their marriage relationships were failing uh, as well. And so the Old Testament closes with the prophetic promise of the work uh, of John the Baptist. And so we read in Malachi uh, chapter, hang on, let me get it, there we go. In Malachi uh, chapter four, uh, verses five and six, what he says, he says, behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. That's Malachi talking. Then we go to Luke 1.17 and Luke says, it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So here in, in Luke 1 17, you know, uh, we have uh, an angel speaking to Zach, not Zechariah, but Zacharias, who was John the Baptist's father in announcing that his wife uh, Elizabeth would have a son and there's a connection between what Malachi said would happen and the fulfillment of what Malachi said uh, in uh, the book of Luke. And so we have a, a final review. So that's the book of Malachi. That's what it's about. That's what it's uh, pointing to and some of the features that we uh, notice uh, about it. I want to give you a chart now that, um, uh, that summarizes everything we've done in the last uh, 10 uh, lessons. And I believe this chart is in your, uh, is it in your, uh, it's in your copy books, right, student. So I'm not, gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna read all of this here. I just wanted to make sure that you were aware that you have a chart here uh, as a quick reference. So anytime you, know, you want a quick refer a reference to see which prophet talked about what or when this particular prophet was, uh, uh, was ministering, you have the name of the prophet, the years where approximately, the years where he was ministering, the audience, who his audience was, Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, or some other country, and the kings or rulers uh, under which uh, they, um, they worked. So uh, that chart, you can keep a, a bonus. You get to keep that chart uh, with you. Uh, let's just do a couple of lessons for today as we close out the lesson and as we close out the series. Uh, lessons for today from Malachi this time. First, ignoring worship is a sin. I, I, I tried to make it as simple as possible. Five words, ignoring worship is a sin. You know, simple indifference toward the worship and the service to God is judged as a grievous sin. God cannot bless such a person 
until his attitude changes. Sometimes, you know, there's a connection between our lack of worship and our lack of blessings, sometimes. You know, God still requires sincere worship, even if our worship today is less complex, less demanding than the sacrificial system under the law. Somewhere along the line, we get the idea because our worship to God today is more, is more simple than it was in the Old Testament it's less necessary. We're less obliged to it. We can skip a month or two, not coming to church, no big deal. You know, it's not like in the Old Testament where you had to do everything by the book. You know, what gives us the idea that in the New Testament, we don't have to do everything by the book? Uh, God calls us not to abandon the assembling of ourselves together. That's a serious you know, demand. Uh, this business of, uh, uh, I know people, you know, they, they, they check in uh, at Christmas time, they check in and maybe uh, uh, during a, a summer series, they check in, you know, just to keep their membership alive. You know, that, that, that may be good on the surface, you know, but does God accept that kind of worship? Really? Not when you look at what was going on in the Old Testament, not that God. And so we need to understand God still requires sincere worship today and steady worship uh, today. It's not because he needs it, it's because we need it. We need him. We need the blessings that he, that he bestows upon us. And then another lesson from Malachi, judgment really is uh, coming. There is really a judgment coming. I want to read a passage here from Malachi. It says, um, for behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. There really is a judgment coming. We, we don't preach that very often. We preach the gospel and the goodness of the gospel, absolutely. But just preaching the gospel isn't enough. We also have to remind the brethren that there's a judgment coming and we have to announce to the world that there is a judgment coming uh, and not to doubt that. The simple message of the last prophet in the Old Testament is that God will judge the wicked and he will reward the faithful. If all the previous prophecies were fulfilled, there's no reason to doubt that this prophecy will be fulfilled. Everything that the other prophets spoke of has been fulfilled. Jesus has come, the church is established. Everything has been established. Why would this prophecy not be fulfilled? That when Jesus comes, there'll be a judgment. The unbelievers and the wicked and the unfaithful will be judged. So we need to keep that in mind also. All right, well, I, that's the end of our series. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, uh, participating, helping us uh, film this and, and uh, getting it uh, onto our website. I'm always also appreciative of those uh, viewers who watch and who support uh, Bible Talk as well and help us to continue our ministry. So thank you and God bless you. <laughs>